Hi everyone, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. Every Friday, we release a live film chat with a professional to discuss their their approach to their work. Uh, today, I'm joined by Glenn, uh, Glenn, sorry, Glenfield Payne, uh, the sound designer for Venture Brothers, Beasts of No Nation, Master of None, and so much more. Uh, hi, Glenfield. Uh, welcome to Filmmaker U. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, one of the things I noticed when I was going through your uh, your IMDb is that uh, you it looks like you did a lot of work with Eugene Garrity. Um, I did. Yes. What did you What did you learn from his team that you've sort of brought into your own career? Because you've created this amazing career after your work with him. Uh, well, I mean, it was great. Uh, I was very very fortunate in that when I started doing sound post. I started at C5, which was the boutique sound house in New York City at the time. I mean, they boasted uh, having clients as Martin Scorsese, the Coen brothers. Um, I mean, it was like New York City, the creme <laughs> of the creme was working with them. Um, my first film in post was um, Malcolm X. Uh, so I ended up interning in picture at the picture department for four months. And then I transferred to sound, um, and it was just wonderful. And basically for the next nine, nine and a half years, I just went from job to job to job at C5. Um, during that time, I knew I wanted to be an effects editor because, you know, being of a certain age, I saw Star Wars episode four as a kid and was just blown away. Um, Working with Eugene and Skip, um, Ron Bocar, and I'm just really mentioning the effects people there. Mm -hmm. There are many other people who taught me many other things, um, especially Philip Stockton, who really took me under his wing uh, when I was apprenticing and assisting. Um, but working with, you know, especially Eugene, uh, he, I really just got to see how every sound mattered. Um, you know, I spent really the beginning of my sound effects editor career. I mean, my first job was Fargo, which was like amazing. Uh, and I will say it was a little nerve wracking. You know, I finally made it, you know, they're like, you're going to cut <laughs> effects on this job. And they're like, here you go. And I sat in a room for like days, just terrified. <laughs> like, I don't know what to do. Um, but you know, working with him, you know, I knew that I had to always bring my A game and I, and it was great because he would review and say, you know, not this, that's good, go back. Um, so I did have someone uh, to sit over my shoulder and say, okay, this is where we want to go and this is where we don't want to go. And also when I was assisting, Back in the day, even though he was working on a Synclavier, and then at that point we had moved to Sonic Solutions, but when he was still working on a Synclavier, he still had to print to Mag. Um, and I would end up printing his sound effects. So I got to listen to them. And, you know, and then it was raw because I was printing, you know, I think he had a three track, right? So I was printing three tracks at a time to Mag um, and building reels. Uh, but also it was really nice as an assistant, I got to spend a lot of time on the mix stage. So uh, editors really didn't get that opportunity. Uh, but as an assistant, I not only got to see what it was like when I was building the tracks, but I got to see it getting put together, which was really incredibly helpful. Now you mentioned that you started in picture and then after four months you moved into sound. What was it that brought you or made you desire to go into sound or what, what attracted Listen, you? Listen, I, I always wanted to do sound. I had no interest in picture at all. Um, and I, you know, I used to build scenery. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was working in New York, uh, building scenery for Broadway and TV shows. And then every once in a while, I would go back to Pittsburgh where I went to school and um, work on a film. And while working on one of those films as a carpenter, the production manager, you know, ended up interviewing us and asking what we wanted to do. And I said, I'm really interested in sound. 
And she got me a position being a cable man, which was following the boom guy around. And I was like, anything with sound, I'm just happy to do. And she was really nice enough to set up some interviews for me when I got back to New York. So that helped me move into sound. And um, during one of those interviews on the way out, I ran into someone at the elevator and they said, hey, why don't you get on to 40 acres? You know, I know they're, they hire interns. And I walked in, they're like, yeah, we just fired the last guy. He was an idiot. Um, can you not be an idiot? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and um, so I ended up working on Malcolm X, which uh, Skip had told me he had a job coming up and I figured, oh, well, maybe it's this job. And so he could have been blowing me off, but you know, my stupidity worked because for four months while working in the picture department, I kept telling everyone, yeah, I'm going to be working on sound <laughs> when sound yeah. starts. So when sound started, they're like, aren't you supposed to be at sound? And, you know, I got whisked off the sound. So, you know, I always tell people, listen, take any job in the industry. Um, you know, don't hold out for the perfect job because you never know, A, you might end up liking that job. You know, it might be something that you never thought of. Um, and you might say, hey, this actually is more exciting than what I think I want it to do. But even if it's not, you're going to meet more people and they're going to, you know, see, especially if you're the kind of person who's willing to show up and work. Uh, that's all we're really looking for, right? Especially when you're in a learning position. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to recommend you for other things or turn you on to other things, or you're just going to be exposed to other things. So yeah, it didn't matter that um, I was in picture, especially at an apprentice in an intern level. I mean, you're just carrying boxes around <laughs> and, you know, then you get to do more stuff. You get to start building tracks. Uh, but just being in film in post was like fantastic for me. How do you, when you get a project, how do you work with the director to get on the same page? Uh, well, you know, the first thing I do, if it's at script level is I read a script or if they've assembled the cut, I watch the cut. Um, and, you know, if it's cut or even the script, I read every page. Like I don't skim it because I'm terrified like, oh, that two pages I skipped is where they're like, insert, you know, epic space battle <laughs> that I'll be unprepared for. Um, so, you know, when I'm reading or watching, I am thinking about what do I have to bring to this sound wise? And first it's the basics, you know, like, okay, I see that this is really a film where it's a bunch of people in a room talking or this is a film that has a lot of cape locations, or this is a film that has a lot of cars, or, um, you know, which we don't really get too much in New York, this is like a really cool sci-fi film with things flying in all over the place, which is one of the reasons why I love working on Venture Brothers. Um, but once I've done that, then, you know, I prepare for the meeting and yes, my job is to focus on sound and to deal with fixing sound and putting in the required doors and people walking and all of that. But I'm also thinking about the character. Um, like what can I do sonically to move the story along? Um, and like one of the things I always remember is I was working on a Spike Lee's film, He Got Game. And um, I was working with this really accomplished sound, you know, who was actually a sound designer, uh, Blake Lay. And, um, you know, I was cutting effects, hard effects like doors and cars, and he was doing more of the design stuff. And I was probably doing the backgrounds also. And um, I got his tracks in him and he had this door in there that was like really heavy. And I was like, dude, this is like a flimsy motel door. Like, <laughs> like this thing is like so heavy. He goes, McClendon, this guy just got out of prison. Like, did you notice that when he shuts the door, the first thing he does is open it again and then shut it? He goes, he's used the door shutting and they lock. So that first door close had to bring us back to his prison experience. And I was like, yeah, you know, I can't believe I spent four years in theater school studying scripts and I totally didn't get that. So, you know, I always take that with me when I'm reading a script, like I got to drill down past just what's on the page and think about what this means to the characters and how I can convey that to the audience with sound. Was there, cause you mentioned Venture Brothers and I'm always fascinated, like 
I w- I love working on cartoons because I find that there's almost this weird freedom in working on. Was there a huge freedom with sound in? in well, like well sure. I mean, you know, with with narratives and with um, well, not even narratives, docs, whatever. With live action, we're always battling production sound. I mean, it's very helpful, but you know, there's usually like a lot of noise, you know, which we've are able to get rid of so much, but you know, there are things we have to match. Um, it's realistic, uh, with the venture brothers, it's cartoons. So all of the voices are recorded in a booth. Uh, so they're clean. So we do have to build everything, but that allows us a, l- a ton of freedom, uh, because we're not fighting, uh, real world sounds that we have to match or minimize or um, you just find some way to work in what, what we have. We get to just build from a clean slate uh, and it's, it's great. And then with something like the Venture Brothers where you can have two people talking to, in a room to like a you know, spaceship zooming in to a robot army to mechanical butterflies, it's just fantastic. <laughs> you, you mentioned battling set like the audio from set Mm -hmm. um how do you determine what's usable and what's not i mean there will be certain ones where it's like it's obvious it's not usable because this is like shot in a water tank or something right um but there's those ones that are sort of like on the edge sound effects wise how do you determine what's what's a good one that you should keep and one you should jettison so for for sound effects so like so you know what really happens is um you know, the dialogue editor will, will create a PFX track. Mm-hmm. So um, in addition to cleaning up the dialogue, they're also saying, okay, here's stuff that doesn't have English attached to it, um, that is pretty good for effects. And um, let me put that on a separate track. And the reason we do that is for when we do what's called an M&E, which is a foreign version where we have to strip all the English out we don't want to lose really good production sound. Like, I mean, some of the doors that are recorded on set are, are great. Um, now we'll enhance them, but there's no reason we should get rid of them. You know, they might have the right character. They might actually be a real door, not a flimsy door <laughs> that was just built. Um, I mean, you know, and I think especially more and more, uh, maybe with a lot of the TV stuff that I've been doing lately, uh, they're using real world sets sometimes. So sometimes it, it is an actually really good door. Um, so I'll sometimes say to my dialogue editor, hey, why don't you send me your PFX track um, so I can cut against that. And one reason I want to cut against that is I want to know that the effects that I'm putting are in sync. So at the mix, I'm not slipping things because a lot of times you'll end up with like, two door closes because they're just a little bit off like where I thought it was and where the production was. And if I'm cutting against the guide track, the dialogue editor might've said, you know what, that doesn't look right. Let me line something up. So I try to get that from the dialogue editor so that my effects in Foley can match what we have. Um, Sometimes, you know, it depends on the budget. If we have the time and we can call through the effect, the uh, production audio, and pull out really good effects, we will. Um, I unfortunately, most of the time, am not working on, you know, the kinds of films that allow for that. Uh, But I do grab whatever I hear that I might come across, uh, I use it. Uh, Same thing with temp effects that the picture department may have cut. Um, Sometimes we feed them to them. If it's a film and they ask for stuff ahead of time, sometimes they come up with stuff on their own. I don't take this attitude that it has, everything has to have my stamp on it. Um, if it's good, why not use it as a base? Sometimes it's perfect. I don't even have to change it, but I'm pretty much putting something on top of everything. What, now, what would you say is a scene from your career that you're most proud of? That you're, and, and what is it about that, that sound work that makes you proud of it? Um, well, I, I think it's probably two. One is going to be Venture Brothers. <laughs> um, there's uh, 
this one episode, I am trying to remember, I don't remember the name of the episode, but this, this episode was, was really large. It's normally we get a week to do the effects for the episode. And this one, uh, we put two editors on and we split it up. Uh, this other editor who works on it, Damien Volpe. Um, and uh, he took the second half and I took the first half. And in my half, there was this crazy, uh, it starts with like a shootout and then a car getting riddled. Oh, then a jet takes off. <laughs> then a car gets riddled with bullets. Then there's a motorcycle chasing a car through traffic. Um, you know, and then of course it's a spy car, right? So there's, you know, guns that come out of the lights and there's gas slicks that come out of the back and then, you know, a fire trail. It's, it was just amazing. The you know, probably like running around <laughs> trying to grab all the mugs. Well, you know, that's the other thing now, um, which is why I, I kind of started doing, moving into mixing too, is that I'm mixing mm -hmm. as I'm editing. Um, I mean, one of the amazing things um, you know, I, Pro Tools is the third digital audio workstation, uh, that I'm working with. Um, and I remember moving to it, kicking and screaming. Um, you know, I really loved audio vision. Um, and before that I had really loved sonic solutions. Uh, but with audio vision, I actually got digital picture, like that I was watching all the time with sonic solutions. I was running off of a three quarter inch deck. So I would kind of watch a scene, especially when I was doing backgrounds back then, and I'd mark my in and out points and then I'd build the backgrounds without seeing the picture constantly. And then I'd play it back and make adjustments. Uh, then audio vision came along and I had digital picture and it had a really wonderful bin structure. Um, and then Pro Tools came along and it had the same, but it wasn't as great as audio vision, but then, with the advent of just more computer power, I really started getting able to uh, use automation. So instead of like just kind of setting a pan or setting a volume, I was able to ride that stuff. I was able to move sounds around the space. So all of a sudden it really opened up. Like instead of like sending something to the mix and having the mixer decide how it was going to be and, you know, listening, being like, well, I think you kind of missed that. And again, I wasn't able to go to the mix most of the time. So it was like, just based on what I would write on my key sheets that no one would really look at anyway. Um, now I'm able to make these decisions, but they're virtual. So I'm not locking the mixer into them. Um, and now that our rooms, we have tuned rooms. <laughs> I'm actually able to go back to work at some point <laughs> in my studio. Uh, you know, our edit rooms are tuned. So when we hit the stage, it's not radically different. So in my room, I'm mixing uh, so that when it does get to the mixer, um, if it's not me, if it's someone else, it's not like they're like, oh my God, how do I pull all this stuff together? I've gotten the most of the way there. And then of course they're making changes because they're listening to music in the real dialogue and um, more fully. Um, it's yeah, it's it's not like a complete mess. It's still a lot of work, but it's not crazy. Sorry, I want to jump back because you were telling sure. me about all the different things from the Venture Brothers episode. What was it that made it um, your favorite, or one? Because you, you mentioned there was two things, and the Venture Brothers was your first one. Um, it was just, it was it was a a hard week. You know, it was, it was a lot to get through. And like, every time I would play the scene, I was like, okay, yeah. Oh, I should really do something for that. Oh, well, yeah. Okay. Well, the motorcycle hits, you know, not only should it hit, but I should have a little crunch. Oh, wow. He's shooting a car. Wouldn't it be really cool if we heard, you know, the sound of a glass smashing, you know, when the side view mirror gets hit. Oh, he shoots back. I should really hit that tire, you know, flat tire sound. So like every time I went through, I was adding more and more and more. And then when I finally was like, okay, this is done. It felt so good. And I felt like I had everything. Um, and it wasn't just that I ran out of time. Like I actually, at this instant felt like, yeah, this is really, it. this is like something that's so good. Um, and that was many years ago. And, you know, 
le- I, I like to think that my editing is leaps and bounds beyond that, but it's still something I look back at the time and I was like, yeah, I felt really good about that. Okay. What, was um, the other, what was the other one? Um, Beast of No Nation. Um, now, you know, I always feel a little strange about it because it's a film that I ended up taking over. I didn't do it from the beginning. So there was a lot of sound work done, but then my crew and I came on and we really added to it. And um, working with Carrie, you know, here's a director, like some directors, you know, they kind of just give you a general way to go. And then you're kind of always asking for input. Carrie was like, not that guy. He was like very specific. Um, And and I I remember we had a scene where um, the lead, runs into the jungle his he's seen his family get murdered and he runs and he wakes up the next day and he's walking around and then this firefight breaks out around him and you know we had all these bullets and arrows whizzing by and all this crazy stuff and then carrie was just like that's just way too much (laughs) and we he's like okay let's take everything out and we just built it up you know bit by bit Um, where we probably ended up with maybe like 15% of the stuff that we had. But with that, you were able to focus more on what was going on instead of just being assaulted by this wall of sound. Um, And actually, that's not the scene that I was going to think of, but I just remembered working with him and being appreciative of having a director um, that um, is so involved. I mean, I would hear like him tap, tap, tap on his laptop. And I was like, okay, I can feel it. Here it comes. He's going to show us a scene. And, you know, that would be him on YouTube. Okay. See this scene. That's what we need to, you know, think about. Uh, so that was really, really cool. Like having someone so invested in the sound and really pushing us um, to make it better. And we ended up with a product at the end that I'm extremely proud to have my name associated with. Um, I think that the scene that I'm thinking most about though is um, um, Idris Elba gives a speech and then they decide they're gonna take this town. And it just kind of starts off with one bullet whizzing by and, and hitting a you know, like a brick mud wall behind our main character. And, you know, he's like, what was that? And, you know, just like that one bullet hitting the wall hearing all the debris pop out of the wall and hit the ground. And then we moved into them marching across this bridge and taking this town and the gun battle and, you know, more really large caliber bullets, like hitting walls and really feeling them chunk out the bits of wall, grenades going off. Um, And then at the end, they, um, they've won, right? They've taken this town and they're celebrating and they're all like dancing. And I remembered from the temp that it felt, it felt more, uh, what's the word? I, I just felt something more in with the temp. And at that point, you know, we were like way over. It was a Saturday, you know, we weren't supposed to be there. Um, we're exhausted. And I was just alone in a room with, with Carrie. And I was like, you know, I'm really hesitant to say this because I don't know what the solution is yet. But, you know, I'll, I can't let this go. I said, I feel like whatever we've done here, we've, we've lost some emotion from where we were before. And I just, you know, I'm like kind of, you know, saying what I've done is wrong here, but I feel like we need to find a way to go back and get that emotion. And, you know, when everyone walked back in the room, you know, he's like, okay, we got to go back into the scene. And, you know, that was kind of the day that I felt like, okay, now is the day I've become a supervisor. Now is the day that I'm, you know, I'm not, you know, taking marching orders. I'm not thinking about this really technically. I'm here on a big film and like, I've had a really emotional and creative moment that I've shared and now we're going to go back and fix it. And that just really made me feel like, yeah, okay, now, now I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. It's such a great feeling to get into that groove with a director where you're just sort yeah. of both on the, on the same wavelength, I guess. Is there something you do to 
I guess, suss out your relationship with a director before taking a job? Like... <laughs> uh, well, I, I mean, you know, for me, like, I'm going to take whatever comes along, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, I, 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 I hope for today that I, you know, I get to the point in my career where I can like pick and choose. Um, you know, I, I've got two teenagers, uh, you know, one who just started college and one who's going to be going off next year. So <laughs> Papa's got to pay bills. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um it, you know i you know it it is it is difficult right because you don't want to be you know afraid to talk to them but at the same time you know you you don't want to offend people so you you know you just got to know how to talk to people you know you got to be a little bit of a therapist um so you know you spend time you know you have a spotting session and then you're maybe talking while you're doing the edit, maybe sending stuff over, maybe like, you know, I'm doing something, you know, can I bring this over to your edit room or even better, can you come over and take a look at it here so you can hear it better because I wanna like make a decision about this before we go to the mix. And then when you're at the mix, in the beginning, it's a dialogue edit and, you know, it's, it's kind of boring. Usually a lot of times they won't be there, but if they're there, that kind of gives you the chance to like joke around a little bit. if this is a director you can joke around with <laughs> um, and like kind of form, you know, a little bond and, you know, hopefully get them to trust you. Um, and then also, I always say the first day, you know, that first reel, you have to nail it because that sets the tone. If the first reel is like a problem, then everything you do after that is going to be suspect. Right, so you really have to like come in and it's not that the other reels aren't gonna be good, but you've got to put your best foot forward from the beginning because once people lose confidence in you, it's probably impossible to get that back. Um, so, you know, you, you really knock it out of the park in the beginning and then that just kind of sets the mood. Like, listen, I know this is your baby, it's not mine. You know, I, I feel really strongly about it, but this is yours and I'm here to serve your vision and I'm here to, you know, bring my expertise to that and sometimes say to you, maybe let's think about this. And, you know, as you do that more and more, um, you, you build that relationship where you get to the point where you can say something's not right. And it's hard to say something's not right and I don't know how to fix it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but, you know, it is a collaborative process. And sometimes, you know, they'll have an answer for you or sometimes someone else in the room will have an answer for you. And I, you know, when I sit there and I'm working with, if I'm like, I'm usually not the only mixer. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I'm not mixing at all. Uh, but I like to work with mixers that are collaborative, not like this is my mix. Um, you know, I like to work with people that are like, you know, we're all here as a team. I mean, definitely the lead mixer is leading it, you know, mm -hmm. like, and that's usually the dialogue or um, dialogue music editor. They're, they're the ones who are doing the heavy lifting. You know, I've pre-mixed the effects in my room as I've been editing. So like, I'm really just kind of touching things up. Uh, so I know they're doing the heavy lifting, uh, but you know, we should all be lending our ears. You know, even if there's an assistant sitting in a room or an apprentice sitting in a room and they, they hear something, you know, I think back to my days when I was an assistant and apprentice, you know, I'd, I'd write a note and slip it to the supervisor <laughs> so that, you know, cause I didn't want to be out of place, you know, but I was like, Hey, you know, just, it, I saw something here. You might want to check that out. Um, and I think it was appreciated and I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, we're all there serving the same purpose, which is to get something out there what the audience thinks we didn't do anything, right? So basically the audience thinks it's all recorded on set, it's all real, and they're like, what did you guys do? And then we know we've done a good job. Now you mentioned that your kids are going off to college. Are they gonna follow in your footsteps and? <laughs> God, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, my, my daughter's a freshman. Uh, so, you know, if we were lucky, she is in a small college in Massachusetts and, uh, they did really good until Halloween and then some of the kids got stupid and the numbers spiked and then they came uh -huh. home. Um, hopefully she's going back at the end of the month. Not that I don't love her, but you know, it, the college <laughs> experience needs to be on campus. Not, Are you, you know, supposed to be having bedroom. like a, an empty nest issue right now? <laughs> I, you know, I, I am, I love my kids, but yeah. I am looking forward to freedom. 
<laughs> um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm looking forward to them getting on with their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was a time when my daughter wanted to be an actress and I was like, oh God. <laughs> I was like, I know how hard that is. Yeah. Um, and then, she, you know, she came to me one day. She's like, oh, dad, I figured out I'm not going to be an actress anymore. I'm going to be the English major. I was like, oh, that's probably even worse. <laughs> and she's but, like, you know, philosophy now, major. <laughs> right, yeah. I'm like, marry well, sweetheart. <laughs> um, but, you know, now she doesn't know what she wants to do. Yeah. And that's great. She's, uh, she'll be 19 next month. And she shouldn't have it all figured out. Yeah. Um, I definitely so, didn't have it figured out. <laughs> yeah, I, I went to school. I was an engineering major really for three weeks, but I had yeah. to finish out the semester. And then, you know, fortunately, I had a teacher who was like, you hate this. Why don't you switch majors? And I had yeah. no idea that I could. And I switched into drama. Um, and it was the best decision I made. Now, I have one last question for you that I ask everyone yeah. I, I interview. Now, we've been going through this pandemic uh, mm -hmm. And so a lot of people have been able to watch a lot of television and a lot of movies. Is there something you've, you found during the pandemic that you're like, oh, other people have got to check this out, either a movie or a show? Uh, I mean, you know, so, I mean, fortunately, I, I'm lucky. I, I got into the Academy um, a few years ago and Eugene was uh, one of my sponsors. So, um, oh, wow. you know, I send him a check every month, <laughs> but, um, so I have been watching like at least two movies a day. Sometimes, you know, I'll get up to a day where I watch four. Um, so I am, it, it's really hard for me to keep them in my mind, but I, I will say, I did see, um, there's a couple of international films that so far have really stood out to me uh there's one called leap uh it's a chinese submission this year it's about their volleyball program um and it's it's really kind of like two films in one it kind of starts off very much like oh you know here it's china back in the 70s and it's very like yes and you know kind of wrote and then it really kind of takes off into a whole nother film for the second half uh so that was very interesting and and then i saw this uh documentary called collective um i think it's romanian um, it's about a fire that happened in a club in Romania and all these, you know, I think like 20 or like 13 or 20 kids died during the fire. And then many more ended up dying in hospitals due to infection afterwards. It was just about how corrupt the hospital system and pretty much everything else is. And, you know, how these poor families ended up losing their children uh, because of this corruption. Yeah. And uh, one of the things I noticed about that documentary was there was very little music in it. Um, and it was, they were just really telling this story um, with the dialogue and, you know, I'm sure, you know, the sound effects that just support that. Um, yeah. So I would say those two are the ones that stick out to me right now. Well, thank you so much for letting us interview you today. Oh, uh, you're welcome. And uh, enjoy more of your films for Pandemic and enjoy doing more sound design. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, so nice thanks. to meet you. Have a good one. You too. Bye.